well, boys. Looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? My name is Eric, and to talk with me today about, uh, I don't know, the artistic process Yeah, okay. is, uh, is Michael Kester. Michael, what's going on? Uh, in general or on the, on the show Just today? in life, man. Just you know, in life. Um, it's, just, it's tough being an artist and trying to find integrity when uh, other people uh, are trying to steer you in a less integritous direction. Um, makes me just, sometimes I don't want to talk at all. Other we times, are doing the, are you making silent film jokes already? No. We're doing The Artist and we're doing uh, Barton Fink. Right. Getting a little Cohen today, but only in the second part. We are. Chapter two. We are. Which you could skip to if you don't want to hear us talk about The Artist. Yeah, man, you're on top of this. Uh, use the chapter to skip over The Artist if you haven't seen it yet. I know it's newer and it's French and it's in 4 by 3 Is that a reason people don't see films? Might it's be. in 4 by 3 I was going to go see The Artist, but it's only available in 4x3. I'm not going. Uh, and skip over to Barton Fink. It really which... depends on how much John Goodman you want to see today. Whoops, that's an accident. That really... I We've just stopped looking at the actors and the features because we found that pairing movies together, when you have to go, oh, but John Goodman's in both, and then it's going to seem like we did a John Goodman double feature. You can't think about that. Otherwise, you don't do Children of Men for three years. Anyways, we're going to spoil the two films. Yes, we are. Um, let's talk about The Artist first. Okay. Uh, I want to talk about it as a modern silent film. Aside from an uh, Academy Award winning film. Which, Academy Award. I mean, yeah. recent Academy Award. We do, we do shows where we have films that probably have won Academy Awards. Yeah, 30 um, years ago. Yeah, we Was just the Academy even... around 30? What is the Academy? The Academy is a group of old people that decide what movies people should like. Ah, right. Um, that was not a facetious question, by the way. I, I don't know which one the Academy yeah, Awards are. Uh, Oscars. Okay. And That's, uh, <laughs> That doesn't help me at all. That detail means nothing to me. Sorry, yeah. go on. The things that are, they're, they're heavier in real life. Right, right. Um, the reason that I bring up that this is an Academy Award winning film is because it's a recent Academy Award winning film. Say an Academy Award winning film that has won an Oscar in the time Double Feature has been putting out shows. Oh, there you go. And so it is definitively a moment in cinema where somebody has called out, this film is how you should be making films right now. Is that kind of how you would consider the awards? That's what I would, yeah. Okay. Uh, what the, what is it? Um, I'm always looking for some reason for those to exist. Best, so. best picture. That's the, that's the award. Best Great. picture. It also won um, uh, best actor for Jean Dujardin's role. And it does a lot of absolutely astounding things, which I would tout is what the Academy needs to be looking for in films. Astounding things. Um, yeah, things that you don't get Not done. Not just I Modern, felt like... silent film attempts. Sure. You know what I mean? Sure. It also does the kind of thing that I don't like from the Academy, the, what you and I will call lowest common denominator. Sure. Catering to an audience, pandering to a wide group of people in order to make them feel like they're really feeding on some right. artistic depth. Yeah. It's good at that, too. It does yeah. a really good job of doing it's that. It's rare that you get something that juggles both of these. Yeah, this. and that's that's why I think the artist uh, is something um, something of a marvel in modern modern cinema, because it's so ambitious without being... Um, cheap. Cheap. Just without cheap being Well, stupid. It's, it's ambitious without being too self-indulgent, Yeah, and it doesn't turn people away by being, say, I don't know, for lack of a better word, French. That's the thing, man, is uh, we're going to do a dedicated, you know, when I say, oh, let's talk about it as a modern silent film. Well, of course you're going to do that because that's, you know, sure. that's exactly what it is. But, uh, man, I hear, hey, really popular French movie that's coming out. Yeah. It's silent and black and white. Uh -huh. It's almost a joke, uh -huh. you know, and for it to get away not being those things you sure. said, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, Absolutely. It has this kind of commitment to it. It reminds me of uh, when we did the Mel Brooks movie. Yeah. Uh, uh, Young, Young Frankenstein. Frankenstein Young right? Frankenstein. So, yeah, right. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, it just even the opening credits, it has this, the the subtle shift in backgrounds, you know, when it's giving those opening yeah. credits as if it would have been so easy to just do on a computer, standard static background, but every time one card fades in or another, it, it shifts just enough to look like... Uh-huh. Somebody took the care to go, oh, if we really stare at this, it'll look like we're 
were stopping the camera and putting another card in and starting the camera uh-huh. back up. Just those small moments that give it this kind of dedication to appreciating what these old movies were. But I feel like it answers the the question, well, why do a modern silent movie? What, yeah. So isn't that just a silent movie? There's a reason we don't make those anymore. Sure. You know, and that's kind of a lot of what the movie... That's the other thing, man, is it's a fucking silent movie about talkies the end of around. a silent era and yeah, so know. that is one of the most difficult things about the film for me when i started watching it sure is i couldn't tell how meta it was right right it was definitely at least two levels of meta <laughs> sure but as the film went on it got more meta and then it got a little less meta sure. as as it had kind of established itself sure but toward the end they start bringing in all these visual metaphors and these sure dialogue cues that are obviously i mean i i I want to say double entendre but they're not sexual you're right um can you use double entendre outside of a sexual context i think anything can be used in or out of a sexual context god and this is the fucking french episode i'm not even going to be able to pronounce half the things we have to talk about today and english is what i'm questioning yeah double feature not a place you go to to get answers just wait till we get to barton fink So we're trying to do a lot of ballsy things then. We're doing a meta commentary about black and white movies in a black and white movie transitioning into the talkies. Uh Uh-huh. It's really going to have to bring its A game or it's going to fail. It's uh, it's predicated upon showing off what these were. Otherwise, it's telling us and, and not showing us. That's the thing, right? It's saying... Oh, our character is invested in the silent era. He thinks it had more to present than talkies. Uh Uh-huh. If the movie as a silent film isn't better than it would be if people were talking, right? then it's just expecting us to accept sure. that and not going, no, really, look what these films could be. And in thinking about it uh, in the same way when we watched that Mel Brooks movie, I mean, the Mel Brooks movie was calling back to a lot of those ideas and making us feel warm and nostalgic mm-hmm. and going, wow, those were... Twinkling those were some, eyes. Yeah, some really good ideas. And... In this movie, we, we almost have to do even better than that because of how serious it's sure. trying to, to tell the story. Well, it, it definitely comes out of the gate, and it could easily be a parody or a satire. Yeah, right. And instead... We don't have the comedy to fall right. back on and just go, no, that was for jokes, guys. Yeah, and we have to do this difficult thing where the actors have to be dramatic powerhouses, but also overact the way silent yeah. actors yeah, do. Right, they have to use right. a lot of facial expressions and physical cues which detracts from the ability to be dramatic. Sure. I mean that again that's a testament to the to the cast of the film, mm-hmm. to the to the vision of the director of the film and to the attention that goes into making something with this kind of romantic bent because sure. the film is just about the love of cinema and the love of your craft and then just the love of love and the yeah, whole right. I mean it's the romantic era. Yeah. And it's really interesting to see a silent film portray romance in an you know, a modern way. It, yeah. The, it's two people who are in love, not in the flittering eyelashes, right, right. Swooning, falling over, being caught by sure. you know, fanning themselves back sure. to being able to stand up. In nineteen thirties love. Right. Yeah. But it still looks like nineteen thirties silent film. So it's walking that that very, very thin line of being satire uh, that I guess would fall into being satire or being insincere. If it's too over the top, then it's, you know, it's funny. It's the thing that Mel Brooks could do. Go, ha ha, isn't this funny the way people used to act? If it's not enough of that, then it's insincere. Then it's not evangelizing right. the way silent films used to be and the things they could accomplish. It has to be dead in the middle at all times. And if it falls on one side or the other, that's a misstep it's taken. And in that way, I don't feel like it takes any missteps. I feel like it maintains that balance the entire time. Mm-hmm. There are these moments holding up uh, the old silent era that you know really make you think about things you don't normally think about in a movie the when the meta kind of audience looking at a film us right. as an audience looking at another audience watching a silent yeah, film right. yeah. already making us think Terrible about how layers you of meta yeah how you're how do you watch films uh-huh. that's the idea that it's that it's questioning and the movie ends and by then you've kind of backed off of the idea of thinking about how you watch films and you're just looking at oh hey there's John Goodman you know uh-huh. it's it's not an accident that we're placing him that early. We're trying to get the audience's mind off of that. And now we're learning about our main character and right. investing in him. But the movie ends and everybody kind of stops and waits for the applause. 
and then yourself as as a viewer of the movie you sure. stop and wait for the applause and you have to recognize it from their faces uh-huh because oh this is a silent film right. we're not going to get things like that but that mere act of just anticipating and then seeing the the reaction you wouldn't normally uh sit and wait for the reaction you might miss out on a piece of their their performance mm-hmm. because you get the audio cue and that audio becomes important uh-huh. that becomes the moment where your personal tension is relieved you were right there with the characters going are they going to like this film you hear the applause ah they like the film but now you're just studying the faces and it sure. tells you a little bit more about yeah. the characters about how they're going to react because yep. you're watching them you're studying them I think the score is another one of those things that, you know, to go back to the silent era and go, what was good about those movies? What stood out in particular? The score has to carry, it's the entire audio portion right. with uh, the exception of the, the one, the Foley scene, you know, yeah, I'm going to talk which about. Yeah, was terrifying. That's a horrifying yeah, scene. It's... And it's, it's, I was, I wrote that down as being one of the most uncomfortable things. It is, yeah. Because when you've been seeing silence and then just stuff starts making noise, Right. It it's an amazing portrayal of what that character probably thought when he first saw yep. the film with the woman speaking. Sure. How do we put ourselves in, yeah, in his he shoes? He was just sitting there he was just sitting there hearing it and going, This doesn't make sense with what I've seen for sure. my entire life. Sure, right. And that's what it was, is even though it, it just didn't make sense, it felt jarring and kind of gross and ugly and it didn't it seemed to be completely out of context which was exactly what it needed to be sure was totally out of context because that's what the idea of sound and film had become was right, this, this right. sound and film those are you don't put those together right sound is for records sure film is for watching well and the score used to be enough for us right you know we could have music and film and the music in this film, I think it's uh, Ludovic Bors, I believe is how you pronounce that. Okay. That's probably the closest I'm going to get to pronouncing anything today. But it has enough variety, and it, it you know, it's just fucking good. Yeah. But um, it carries the emotion in the soundscape through the whole movie. And before we had talkies, that's what everybody was used to. Just something to really, I think, just as much to keep you immersed in the movie and not thinking about you're actually sitting in a bucket seat in a movie theater because if you can hear the chattering and the popcorn eating and your own breathing sounds it might take you out of the film so the score i mean we got really good humanity got great at creating scores with crescendos and that highlighted different sections and that added mood and tone and atmosphere well i mean and it almost the rhythm you take something um like a uh like an old horror film or a chaplin film where Mm -hmm. the score has to hit when he goes up steps when something crashes i mean the score is basically sound effects yeah it accents let's call it you know musical accents to when crazy you know when the film needs more than just the film to show and give an effect. Yeah, keeping that in sync was really, really important. Making sure those those actions lined up, it's a little less important now because... Because of the nudge tool. It's called the nudge tool. <laughs> well, that, that makes it easier now. <laughs> but no, I mean, it's less important for a film to do that because you have... Uh, mentally, what's happening as you're watching a film is you want the sound effects to sync up. Mm-hmm. So... The music, the more in sync it is, maybe the the more effective it is. But it doesn't. The beats don't have to hit with each footstep anymore right. because that's just kind of how the the chemistry is. That's uh, that's what your brain's looking for. Is just you get a sound every time someone drops their foot, and the sound effects are there. So the score is just a wall of sound in the background. That makes it easier for us today. It makes it better for us today. But when he saw that first talkie, the idea of adding sound effects. I mean, not only was that internally that that kind of chemistry wasn't working for him, it just seemed laughable to him. Yeah. It was, why would you ever add this to a film? Right. It's insane. There's no reason to... It was jarring for him. He had that. He had a totally different internal reaction to it. And, you know, the very next scene, you hear that glass clink down, and you're right, it puts us in this place that he was in. A place that, as an audience of modern film... You might have thought, oh, we could only pretend to identify with him. We could only pretend to go, wow, yeah, that must have been really hard the first time you heard sound in a movie. Wow, isn't that weird? 
But you're right. We get to that scene, and it's weird for us now. Uh-huh. It's to- it's as if we've never watched a movie that had sound effects right. in it before. Suddenly, this is the these are the worst sounds ever. Especially, I mean, these are just sounds inside the room. He leaves the room, and there's that uh, spaghetti western kind of dubbed woman right. laughing outside. Uh, the girls laughing. It starts to actually give me anxiety, man. Yeah. When there there's something about a human laugh when you're not included in it and you're already jarred in the way you are, mm-hmm. that's also... Sure. I mean, it's supposed to give you anxiety. It naturally... What, yeah. are they, what are they laughing about? They're making fun of him. Oh, God, what's happening? And then it just gets to the height of the absurd, of feathers dropping, and as the feather's falling, I, I know what's going to happen yeah. at the end. You know what's going to happen at the end, mm-hmm. right? But it's the, it's the fucking loudest sound of all time. It's uh, uh, some kind of bass kick explosion. And it's, it's funny... But it is also, I mean, you just, you have to laugh at how terrifying this is for him, how bad this situation has got. If you couldn't just believe in that cinematically because the movie's telling you, well, look how bad this is getting, you then see them uh, address the emotional side of that, the very realistic, it's now destroying his career. Mm -hmm. So if you couldn't go, wow, he's just going to have anxiety because people talk in movies now, If if you weren't buying that. Then you see, well, he also has no career, and he's completely out of money and broke and ruined. So there, it really did affect him. This was a weird thing. I mean, we've never really talked about when movies transition to talkies, but it did this strange thing in Hollywood where it's not, you know, people compare it all the time to 3D now, which is funny because, I mean, this movie makes it look like talkies took off overnight. Uh-huh. And 3D after, we've been making fun of 3D for about five years yeah. now. And actually, we've made fun of 3D from films from 30 years ago. So at the very least, I'm not going to come out again on this show and and say, oh, 3D will never happen because I still have to fight off everybody to see the 2D version of movies when I go to the movies. But 3D has not revolutionized the cinema the way talkies did. When talkies happened, all the actors who used to do movies, they didn't do movies anymore. You know what I mean? There were very few. That was a hard thing. Right. It's like transitioning from being a child actor. You're working in a completely, it might as well be a different town. It's not even Hollywood anymore. The rug has been pulled out from under Hollywood. All these actors, I mean, they're using a different skill set. It's even worse than the transition from, you know, trying to go from a, a, a stage actor to a screen actor. You know, think of what's been making a film up to this point. Think of what's been making the artist up to this point. We have a cute little dog. We have comedic timing. We have, um... I mean, the way that uh, Peppy Miller, she can strike that over-the-shoulder look when right. she's dancing. You know that fucking sure. look. That It's as much about modeling, as yeah. especially for women uh, in those movies. Uh-huh. They had to be models. Sure. And they had to be a little comedic. But when we think back to um, even stuff beyond that era, when you think back to the Mel Brooks stuff or the Marx Brothers stuff right. or a lot of the comedy movies that uh, came out maybe 10, 20, even 30 years after this movie takes place, it was still women who are in roles to be beautiful, and uh-huh. then the men make all the jokes. And that happened a lot in silent films, yep. too. The women were there, and they modeled, and they were beautiful, and sometimes they danced. Yeah. That was about the most <laughs> they could demonstrate you know, talents, besides striking a pose. All of a sudden, this isn't about dance and performing and modeling and miming you were doing miming before and now it's about the tone of your voice and how you deliver a line and you know given that talkies are new people are paying especially close attention to that Mm -hmm. a lot of people they just you know you get this uh idea we do the opposite thing here where people just hear our voices and they don't see what we look like and if they see what we look like, it would it would make them crazy. <laughs> they would go, "That's those aren't the people who make those voices." Yep. Um, that was just the opposite thing that happened with talkies. You saw these actors for years, and then you heard them speak for probably the first time, and people didn't even want it. It wasn't even, "Are you going to be good at this?" Yeah. But even when you were good at it, a lot of time audiences just didn't want to see it. And I don't think we've ever had anything happen like that in Hollywood or just in in film, where it became a completely different game overnight and so for the artists to discuss uh, what happened in that era that's a really interesting story to tell his reaction to that is well uh if you don't want me i'll make my own goddamn movie yeah which is the best approach it really is go the independent route 
and his movie's good. It's uh, it's got a bleak, gut wrenching ending. You know, it's uh-huh. his movie is a movie we would do. And, there's a puppy. I mean, it's really everything you want feature. in a film. Hey, puppies were total Oscar bait, really. Puppy, quicksand. The quicksand was the edgy part of his yeah. movie, and the the puppy was the Oscar bait. Comic relief. But it's you know we can see the small reflections of how he's feeling when you want to go into the uh for all of the over the top imagery there are subtle moments where you kind of go oh you can read into the two minutes you saw of his movie and Uh see how it's a metaphor for his life but it also ends on you know the gun in his mouth and man maybe it's the the lack of sound but i'm literally kind of mouthing to myself oh my god don't do that that's the worst thing ever don't shoot yourself in the the head and the movie falls back on comedy bang inner title right car crash just constantly walking that that thin line. Barton Fink is an older movie. It's a Coen Brothers movie. We it's an Oscar movie about. again. Um, yeah, but Oscar this time movie. before double feature, so we have no right to have any. We have no conversation about the Oscars. It's also one of the more loaded Coen Brothers movies yeah. for how simple it appears to be. It's true. I think that says, uh, you know, we might as well just have this conversation right away. Yeah, I kind of feel like that says a lot about the audience. I think so too. People read into these movies a lot. And the Coen brothers give you the ability to sure. do that, but I don't know if that's even their intention, man. Yeah, I mean, I as much as we've covered them on Double Feature and as much as I've gone through and tried really hard to, you know, familiarize myself with some of their more notable work like uh, Blood Simple and whatever, right, right. I still don't know if I fully get, I, I think I get parts of the Coen brothers sure. really well. This is a great film. Why? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, well, here's what happened is we did the big Lebowski and you got it. I know. And and as we were drafting up this year, I thought, man, we, we can't get the Coen brothers already because I don't get the Coen brothers. And unless you know something I don't, then there's more, there's more work left to do. Let's do Barton Fink. I don't fucking understand that at all. It worked like a charm. In responding to a lot of the symbolism from this movie, uh, the Coen brothers always talk about how they did a bunch of instinctive things that felt right for whatever reason. Okay. That was their big thing is, you know, people ask him, well, the symbolism, what, what does this mean here? What's the uh, symbology to you? You know, it felt good at that moment. Huh. And so I think they make movies kind of from their gut like well, that. And I feel like that is a really good way to bury themes in your film. Sure. If you are just making artistic decisions based on how you feel the sure. art should come out. Sure. You're burying your own artistic themes and artistic ideals. Sure. So deep within the film. But they are there. Yeah. I mean, you are going to consistently make choices that deal with the same ideologies that you follow. Sure. Which is going to imbue that into the film. And some of it becomes more obvious. I mean, I, I like to refer to the uh, the Earl, the hotel, yeah. as uh, Hotel Cohen. Yeah. Because right. everything Cohen Brothers see happens in the hotel, starting sure. with Chet. Instead of a bartender, a right. bellhop, <laughs> he's actually doing the Tim Roth four rooms role. I think. Yeah. Can you imagine what four rooms would have been like if it was Steve Buscemi from Reservoir Dogs? I can tell you of... that the misbehaviors would not have called him back upstairs. That's exactly right. That's exactly how that would go. Yeah, you do a movie like this, and that's that's what I really like about the Coen Brothers. I think that gets to the heart of it is that they make these movies that they try to just kind of. You know, they make a bunch of artistic calls and they're not necessarily pointed. They're not necessarily, oh, we're building a metaphor here. It's more just these were the feelings I was getting at the time. These were, it's a more abstract version of the David Lynch thing we talked about where the symbolism is used to instill mood Mm -hmm. rather than to say, oh, here's a clue towards this. The Coen brothers are going, well, I feel like the wallpaper should be peeling off the hotel. (laughs) I mean, that's a more direct one because it's hot. But it's not necessarily because John Goodman plays the devil. You know right. what I mean? That just kind of happens by accident. Uh-huh. Uh, and that's one of the more obvious ones. You look into all of these smaller things, these biblical references. The only thing that I feel like is really pointed in a movie like this, specifically intentionally pointed, is, say, a, a commentary about Hollywood. Right. You know, that's what they set out to do. They write a movie that's, oh, this is going to be a commentary about Hollywood and the things we're feeling and thinking at the time, not specifically saying, this is a story of stuff we went through, but these are some ideas about how, you know, how it is to work with people in right. Hollywood. And they write that part, and then it's just chock full of things that they make a kind of carbon print of their minds. And so by just trying to get as much of their feeling at the time on paper or you know on film, they can then go in later and interpret their own mindset 
they right. can kind of go, what were we thinking at the time? Sure. What was it like to be alive at that time and make a film at that time? Oh, we can always go back and watch Bart and Fink because that felt like a lot of how we were sure. feeling. I think that's a great approach to make a movie. Yeah. But not well, one that's usually solvable. Yeah. Well, and then you just basically make your film about artistic integrity. Sure. Sure. Then, then you're really, you know, you're cooking with gas. If you sure. can make a film about your own actual artistic struggles and make it about a person who's struggling with artistic integrity in Hollywood. A weird person, nonetheless. John Turturro, thirdly. Yeah, yeah. So maybe instead of spending all of this time doing some kind of uh, bullshit Freudian look at the hotel and what it might actually say uh -huh. introspectively about the Coen brothers, let's talk about what they're trying to get at. Yeah. Let's talk about... Uh, can we talk about Charlie and Barton right away? Okay. Because the, you know, the chemistry between those two characters is the one that, to me, that's one of the most enigmatic things I think about when I'm watching this that yeah. I feel like there's tangible answers for. So Barton, you know, stays at Hotel Cohen uh -huh. because he doesn't want to be in, at Hotel Hollywood. Right. He doesn't yeah. want to stay at the, the five-star place. Uh -huh. He wants to be with the common man. I mean, he always talks about how his art comes from this dark hard place and it hurts him to write sure and then charlie comes over and he's you know the common man right he's your salesman and he wrestled in high school and he's got trouble with his weight and he knows that and he just sure. doesn't understand why people have to bring that up sure, when he's sure. just trying to li he's literally just trying to help them yeah by offering them insurance <laughs> and then barton is immediately that shows you because he was not Hollywood. Barton right. is not Hollywood. Right, right. And in the false dichotomy of Hollywood or common man, Barton seems to fall into this obvious decision of not Hollywood, thusly common man. Thusly the common man. Right. But when you introduce the common man, uh -oh. Barton is that he falls into this little valley in between yeah. of just Barton Fink. Hey, wait a second. He's not the common man, right. is he? Okay, so we at least agree on this point before we start getting really deep and, and crazy into this. Because I, you know, I wonder even at that level, if Barton is the common man and if he's really holding up things for the common man. But yeah, I get that same impression. When you see Charlie, that is to say, oh, look, a common man. Right. Yeah, that isn't Barton at a all. A regular fellow. Yeah. So he isn't the common man. That's, that's easy. We know that. But he seems to identify and write for the common yeah. man. So this is when I start thinking, all right, is he actually... The Coen uh, Brothers? Is that the question? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want to read into this, you could start thinking, uh, this is, you know, talking about that idea of how, how do the Coen Brothers feel about, about their, their audience their and, audience and how their they characters. relate to them, yeah. But even to pull back a, a layer from that, I'm just wondering, Barton, is he talking down to the common man by saying, you know, he's not saying that he himself is the hero of the common man, but he's, he does sort of have this martyr thing, don't you think? Yeah, he definitely, he kind of... Um, what is it? The uh, the working class hero. Yeah. The right, uh, the right. hero of the working class man, sure. where he's he's from the depths of the blue collar workers, but he is the voice. He is sure. their voice, and and without him, they would remain a voiceless mob and not understand right, right. the direction of our. And yeah, I, I don't know if he's necessarily saying that, but I think that the longer you watch him talk to Charlie, and the longer he's uh, you know in Hollywood, the more you realize that he feels like his voice is a necessity to somebody like Charlie, Right. where he looks at Charlie and Charlie's speaking and talking about how rough it is to sell insurance. And Barton is going, that's not your real problem. Yeah, right. I right. know your real problem. Sure. And as soon as you leave, I can write it down. It's as if the common man needs fending for. Right. I kind of feel like Barton marches around going, oh, these poor peasants, I'll help the peasants. And the peasants are going, well, hold on, we're just, we're, we're like the majority of, of the right. country. We're just doing our jobs and we don't, we don't actually need, I think he has more in common with Hollywood sure. than he wants to admit. Right. Well, I think he, he, uh, he gets brought to Hollywood because of his wonderful portrayal of the common man, but as interpreted by Hollywood. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. so, and he comes in and real and feels like, well, I'm not these people. These people are, you know, they're making everything for a quick buck. And so I must be. He's the common man of Hollywood, sure. but the Hollywood of the common man. The king of the common men, <laughs> as much as they could ever hope to achieve. <laughs> it's almost, a, I don't want to call it a feigned humility or that, uh, you know, he pretends to be humble. Because I think, 
I think his intentions are well and just. Sure. He that's just his character. He doesn't seem he like doesn't... a malicious person. He's yeah. he seems so unassuming that you can't fault him for doing what he has been told he's good at. Yeah, he's he might just be wrong. He might yeah. just not be the hero of the common people. You know, when you see those interactions between him and Charlie, I mean, that's the movie for me. Every time you see him sitting in a room talking to Charlie, uh, he's talking down to him. He keeps going on. So this is the craziest thing for me from from that first scene. He's going on and on about how the common man has all these stories to offer and he just wants to tell the stories. And then he fucking cuts Charlie off every time Charlie starts telling him one of the common man stories. Right. He starts telling him, uh, you know, well, my customers, you know, one time I had a, a fucking Barton not even thinking about it just goes, yeah, 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 that's nice. I'm, I'm interested in telling stories just like that, just uh-huh. like the one you're trying to tell. When in actuality, he's not fucking interested uh-huh. in the story at all. And I don't think he realizes that. But he kind of talks down to them, too. He has this idea of who the common man is in his head. He keeps saying things like, oh, you know, speaking to you in your language. Right. Like John Goodman's character is some kind of fucking subhuman or something. Sure. You know? He's an immigrant and an alien. Which is why when we get to this uh, this Madman Month thing at the end, <laughs> I mean, it turns out not only not only did John Goodman have some insurance stories, but he might have had some fucking murderous rant. He may be... No, fuck that. He is the most interesting character sure. of any of the lives we could have explored. Right. And Barton was too busy going on and on about how he defends the common man right. to actually listen to these stories. I mean, if you can fault Barton for anything... It's being self-indulgent. It's being this person who's, I don't necessarily want to say he's full of himself. Uh, maybe that's fair. To, yeah. I, do you think Barton's full of himself? I don't think he knows himself well enough to be full of himself. Sure. I think sure. he's, in regards to himself and his art, I think he's sure of himself. Yeah. But maybe not quite full. It's just that when he cuts off Charlie's stories, uh-huh. it's always to talk about himself. Right. Right. And I don't get the idea, you know, he's not carrying himself around like he's full of himself. But if you look at his actions, if you are to judge him by his actions, it's always, oh, yeah, that's a nice story about your customers. Let's talk about what I do. And Uh let's talk about how I really feel for people like you. Uh, This image he has as, uh, you know, of himself as the defender of the, the salt of the earth people. Even when he's talking to his idol, he goes to this guy because he stops and thinks, wow, I really need help with this wrestling picture. And he goes and talks to his idol, and he's talking down to even his idol, too. He's mm-hmm. telling him, you know, I never actually needed alcohol to write my stuff. He's doing it in a way where he's doing it because he's trying to help him. I right. don't think he realizes that what he's the saying is, well, of how he's saying I, it. Yeah. yeah, I never needed alcohol. You know, I found that having alcohol never, never helps. It's like he, it's in his DNA to be a pompous Hollywood prick, and he's yeah. fighting it with everything you know he has in his head. But that conversation is revealing, too, because his idol responds to uh, this, this big statement he made. I feel obligation to help ease the suffering of my fellow man. That's the, the thing he fucking throws out on right. the table. And the fucking writer responds with, Huh, that's interesting. I just like making up stories. Yeah. It's it's just this perfect way of two completely different fucking approaches to this. But it's hard to know how much you can read into. Um, part of what I take away from that story is how sometimes you meet your idols. They're not, you know, they're not what you see. Sure. Um, it also says a lot about how things get written and how, you know, uh-huh. yeah, all his books are written by this woman. Or uh-huh. his last several books have been right. written by this woman. So... It's not just different approaches to writing, but in this case, it's he meets this guy, and it's quite a different picture that than sure. maybe he's painted. I wonder how often that actually happens, where someone else is... You know, we talked about that a little bit on the Poltergeist show. Yeah. About, uh, did Steven Spielberg secretly right. direct well, and this? And there's that, that whole... I mean, they made a film about it, but that whole speculation that Shakespeare never wrote a word of... Right, right. When somebody does a good job... I think it's just general, uh, I mean, it's it falls into the level of conspiracy where sure. if something is really good or say, I don't know, too good to be true, right? it usually is. Uh, sure. And so then people will say, well, you know, say for, for the purposes of double feature, Quentin Tarantino consistently makes good films. Right, right. Thusly, he could not 
possibly be writing his own films. Sure, sure. Because somebody without his name must be as good sure. as he is. You know what I mean? Well, that's where Occam's Razor comes right. in. Right. Would it make more sense in this case that Quentin Tarantino is just a collective of good filmmakers or that it is just one guy who's pretty good and we identify with a lot yeah. of the stuff he's made? It's really... That maybe culturally, Quentin Tarantino, everybody looks at every single film he makes and goes, ah, the next Quentin Tarantino. Uh-huh. You know, you can ask that about Shakespeare. It doesn't make more sense that... Shakespeare is actually this man, this title that all these great works have been collected under, or maybe even more so that we think a lot of these works are great because they were written by Shakespeare and we know he's good. Well, I mean, <laughs> you know even I mean? even to to kind of reel it back into Barton Fink, look at the Coen brothers. Wasn't yeah. Joel credited as director for the former part of their career? He was. And yeah. Ethan Ryder. Sure. When in reality, it was probably both of them writing and both of them directing as they finally come out and been credited. But I mean, that could even just be commentary to, you know, who's really pulling the strings with right. the filmmakers of Barton Fink. Sure. Um, it's just when you have idolatry involved and this mm. attachment to an artist, it's always a concern that maybe you're valuing the wrong person for right. the wrong reasons. Yeah. And maybe they're going to end up dead next to you in bed. So this wouldn't be a Coen Brothers movie if there wasn't a weird fucking thing that happens at the end to completely yeah. throw you off from ingesting the right. film the way you thought you could. Yeah, so I was watching Barton Fink, as I watch all Coen Brothers <laughs> movies, expecting uh -huh. something is going to... They light the hotel on fire. Right. Somebody stops falling in midair. I mean, all of these possible things. But in this case, the hotel catches on fire and I'm the devil... Heil Hitler. <laughs> right. Let's kill all the cops. Yeah, uh, I'll show you the life of the mind. Um, just <laughs> standing at the end of this hallway, it's, uh, it's John Goodman turns and he puts down this fucking briefcase and he's going down. You know, this is right after you got the two gumshoe cops yeah. who are just, you know, chomping off each other's sentences as if the movie is now about them. They're squaring off against Charlie. Sorry, Madman Munt. Uh -huh. Let's stick with Madman Munt because you really just completely different fucking character yeah. for all we can tell at this point. Or who you might believe is a different character, but later talks to Barton, and you know this has been the same guy the he whole time. He bridges the gap, yeah. Barton just in in not taking time to really get to know his fellow man, maybe didn't realize that he was secretly this uh, this other person. So he turns, he puts down this fucking briefcase, and the fire just follows him down the hallway. Yeah. I love the way this is done. It pans to his you know his room. We get to see. It takes us out of that centered, cinematic, looking down the hallway perspective mm -hmm. just long enough to ground it a little bit in reality to sit on the bed with Barton and just watch John Goodman coming down the hall like a fucking right. monster with this shotgun. And as he's standing there over the officer on the floor, the fire overtakes him. It essentially passes him on this hallway and uh, just engulfs everything. And somehow all the characters... Totally fine in yeah. this hotel that I can only assume is burned down or something. And the movie just keeps uh, keeps right on going. It seems dangerous to ever stop at one of these scenes, as I always want to do, and go, uh, what? You're floored here. Your take on this. I mean, what is this? What's happening here? It's this moment that the Coen brothers tend to do where the metaphor outweighs the reality. They bend the reality of the film in order to suit this iconography and i will right. not deny the iconography sure. of madman munt in a flaming hallway with a R shotgun right. well you know what else is crazy is you're right we get one of these every it was yeah. in oh brother or art thou it was, it's every fucking movie and somehow i'm still never ready for it well the thing <laughs> it's... the thing that i think the coen brothers do and i'm kind of realizing this and i'm as much as i've hated it within the films i love it as an idea mm -hmm. they've come to this conclusion that a suspension of disbelief need not be prefaced in your establishing of the film. Sure, sure. You, they feed you a reality, which you then just come to trust as a reality remarkably similar to your own. Sure. And then when they do something that is completely outside of your own reality, they say, well, this has always been possible. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It just right. hasn't come up till now. Yeah. I don't know why you assumed this was your world. Right, right. I mean, do you know these people? You probably know people like them. Yeah. But do you yeah, actually they know don't, them? They don't they're like not the real. They're not human. They don't exist in real life. Yeah. Why, what made you think this was reality? Totally an okay thing to do. Yeah, it really is. Totally it's, an okay thing to do. It's kind of a, it's a literary device almost sure. where they're toying with the audience's 
acceptance of reality. Sure. And they're they're basically saying fuck you to the person who assumes too much about yeah. the film, sure. the the world they've been given. The Coen brothers basically at the end of every one of their films go fuck you. This is our world. <laughs> yeah. Right. We get to do whatever we want. Yeah. As storytellers. And in the end, doesn't that make a better climax than what would have been the climax, which is Barton Fink uncharacteristically dancing? Yeah. I'm going to say good decision. Uh, we have a website. If you we disagree, you can do. use it to send us a, an email. You can actually find all the other Coen Brothers movies we've done with a simple link. Go on this page and click the Coen Brothers. Hell yeah. All the shows we've done with them. So like a Brother Arthur that would be there? Yeah, that would be there. Wow. Uh, we could list <laughs> off all the episodes, but I really have. No interest in padding out the show. <laughs> Thanks for opening that uh, door for me. Um, Doublefeatureshow at gmail.com would be the email address. Where, where you can could... send us a GIF image of Barton Fink tap dancing. Just paste uh, John yes. Turturro's head on the scene from the artist, please. <laughs> it's, either one of those would be fine. Any GIF images are appreciated. Really, of this or any film. Just send us GIF images, I suppose. No, wait, sorry. I want to step back for a, a moment there. Send us GIF images of that in particular. I don't want people to think they can get away with just anything here. Speaking of getting away with anything, uh, what are the two movies oh, next time? Oh, Long Johnson. We're doing Galaxy Quest uh -huh. and The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai Across the Eighth Dimension. Shin, shin, shin. Really anything could happen on that show. I have, I have no idea where we'll be a week from now. <laughs> Watch more fucking film. Bye. So on the same subject, uh, do you remember Henry Rollins back when we did Feast? Yeah, sure. Um, and eventually we'll see him again on the show when we get to Wrong Turn 2. Um, <laughs> yeah, when and if that ever happens. But, send us ideas for Don't do that. <laughs> but Henry Rollins, he used to be the, uh, the front man for uh, 80s punk man, Black right. Flag, uh, and since has gone on to be a public speaker, and he's a very, very brilliant brilliant mind sure highly recommend listening reading up on some henry rollins ideology sure. because he's he's not a preacher in the conventional sense he's a really smart guy but he says basically on the same subject someone asked him uh in an interview saul williams asked him in an interview they interviewed each other for oh, cool. a magazine it was one of those things where they yeah, make it's terrifying <laughs> yeah um and saul williams asked him you know don't you ever feel the social pressure to you know find someone you're in love with and settle down and have kids and Henry Rollins said, you know, I don't even, that doesn't even cross my mind. Like I'm not out living, looking for love. Sure. He, I mean, when I saw him talk, he had just talked about how he had two free weeks in his schedule. So he planned a world trip to third world countries sure. on foot. Yeah. I mean, just because he, that was something he wanted to add to his life. Get out there and do things. And he says on the subject of marriage, he says, you know, that's such a well-traveled path. Yeah. I mean, right. I can't do everything. I'm only going to live 80 years. Yeah. I can't do everything in the world, but I do know that falling in love and having children is something people can do and do well. And so I'll let the other 5 billion people do that. Yeah. And I'm going to go out and have an experience less common to, sure. the, to humanity. Well, boys, looks like you start the fun without me. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? Give me one goddamn reason why I shouldn't blow your goddamn brains all over that goddamn wall. My name is Eric, and to talk with me today about, uh, I don't know, the artistic process. Yeah, okay. Is, uh, is Michael Kester. Michael, what's going on? Uh, in general or on the, on the show today? Just in life, man. Just you know, in life. Um, it's just, it's tough being an artist and trying to find integrity when uh, other people uh, are trying to steer you in a less integritous direction. Um, makes me just, sometimes I don't want to talk at all. We times, are doing the, are you making silent film jokes already? No. We're doing the artist and we're doing uh Barton Fink. Right. Getting a little Cohen today, but only in the second part. We are. The Academy is a group of old people that decide what movies people should like. Ah, right. Um, that was not a facetious question, by the way. I, I don't know which one the Academy yeah, Awards are. Uh, Oscars. Okay. And That's, uh, th that doesn't help me at all. That detail means nothing to me. Sorry, yeah. go on. The things that are they're they're heavier in real life. Right. Right. Um, 
the reason that I bring up that this is an Academy Award winning film is because it's a recent Academy Award winning film. Say an Academy Award winning film that has won an Oscar in the time Double Feature has been putting out shows. Oh, there you go. And so it is definitively a moment in cinema where somebody has called out, this film is how you should be making films right now. Is that kind of how you would consider the awards? That's what I would, yeah. Okay. Uh, what the, what is it? Um, I'm always looking for some film, reason for those to exist. Best, so. best picture. That's the, that's the award. Best Great. picture. It also won um, uh, best actor for Jean Dujardin's role. And it does a lot of absolutely astounding things, which I would tout is what the Academy in chapter two. We are. Which you could skip to if you don't want to hear us talk about the artist. Yeah, man, you're on top of this. Uh, use the chapter to skip over the artist if you haven't seen it yet. I know it's newer, and it's French, and it's in 4x3. Is that a reason people don't see films Might it's in 4x3? I was going to go see the artist, but it's only available in 4x3. I'm not going. Uh, and skip over to Barton Fink. It really which... depends on how much John Goodman you want to see today. Whoops, that's an accident. That really... I We've just stopped looking at the actors and the features because we found that pairing movies together... When you have to go, oh, but John Goodman's in both, and then it's going to seem like we did a John Goodman double feature. You can't think about that. Otherwise, you don't do Children of Men for three years. Anyways, we're going to spoil the two films. Yes, we are. Um, let's talk about The Artist first. Okay. Uh, I want to talk about it as a modern, silent film. Aside from an uh, Academy Award winning film. Which, Academy Award. I mean, man. recent Academy Award. We do, we do shows where we have films that probably have won Academy Awards. Yeah, 30 um, years ago. Yeah, we was just the Academy don't even, around 30? What is the Academy? It needs to be looking for in films. Astounding things. Um, yeah, things that you don't get Not done. Just I Modern, felt like... silent film attempts. Sure. You know what I mean? Sure. It also does the kind of thing that I don't like from the Academy. The What you and I will call lowest common denominator. Sure. Catering to an audience, pandering to a wide group of people in order to make them feel like they're really feeding on some right. artistic depth. Yeah. It's good at that, too. It does yeah. a really good job of doing it's that. It's rare that you get something that juggles both of these. Yeah, and that's that's why I think the artist uh, is something um, something of a marvel in modern modern cinema, because it's so ambitious without being... Um, cheap. Cheap. Just without cheap being well, stupid. It's, it's ambitious without being too self-indulgent, yeah. and it doesn't turn people away by being, say, I don't know, for lack of a better word, French. That's the thing, man, is uh, we're going to do a dedicated, you know, when I say, oh, let's talk about it as a modern silent film. Well, of course you're going to do that because that's, you know, sure. that's exactly what it is. But, uh, man, I hear, hey, really popular French movie that's coming out. Yeah. It's silent and black and white. Uh -huh. It's almost a joke, uh -huh. you know, and for it to get away not being those things you sure. said, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, Absolutely. It has this kind of commitment to it. It reminds me of uh, when we did the Mel Brooks movie. Yeah. Uh, uh, Young, Young Frankenstein. Frankenstein Young right? Frankenstein. So, uh, right. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, it just even the opening credits, it has this, the the subtle shift in backgrounds, you know, when it's giving those opening yeah. credits as if it would have been so easy to just do on a computer, standard static background, but every time one card fades in or another it shifts just enough to look like uh -huh. somebody took the care to go, oh, if we really stare at this, it'll look like we're, we're stopping the camera and putting another card in and starting the camera uh -huh. back up. Just those small moments that give it this kind of dedication to appreciating what these old movies were. But I feel like it answers,